So now that we know some of the rules about derivatives, so let's just kind of just review quickly what we know. We know how to deal with power functions, polynomials. Um, we know how to do a quotient and a product. Um, the next set of facts that will be helpful is to find the derivatives of the trig functions. Now, they're just things you have to memorize. No two ways about it. Just got to memorize it. We're going to do the standard six trig functions, and then we'll talk about um, uh, higher order sines and cosine derivatives. So the first two facts that you definitely have to have memorized is that the derivative of the sine is a cosine, and the derivative of a cosine is the negative sign. What's really cool about that, why it works like that at least, okay, let's look at the first one. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. So that's approximately what our sine function looks like. And so think about the uh, derivative represents the slope of a tangent. So every place that our sine has a hill or a valley, the slope of the tangent at those peaks and valleys are zeros. <coughs> And then uh, think about here, this part of the function is increasing, so it would have positive slopes. And then this part of our function is decreasing, it would have a negative. And then this part is uh, uh, still increasing. Wait a second, I'm so sorry. I knew that part looked funny. I don't know if I can do it. Wait, let's do it that way. Okay, let's try again. <laughs> okay, so in this section from here to here, it's increasing. So that would be positive. And then decreasing, that part would be negative, and that part would be uh, negative. So what's cool is that if we think about the slopes of the tangents, we end up getting a perfect cosine graph. So the derivative of a sine is a cosine. Now, it doesn't quite happen that way for a cosine. Okay, now let's draw the cosine curve by itself. So that was the red one. Every place that the cosine has a peak or a valley, its derivative is zero. In this part, our function is increasing, so the slope's positive. And in this part, our slope is going downhill, so it's negative. Now, look at our sine graph, which was up here in blue. The green graph is the flip of that graph. So it's not just a positive sign. The derivative of a cosine has to be a negative sign to flip it over and to make the uh, slopes line up properly. So uh, you just got to memorize these facts. There's no way for me to prove it to you. Well, I mean, I could, but the sine is, a derivative is cosine, but it wouldn't be fun. Um, the derivative of a cosine is negative sine. So if they ask me to find the derivative of a function that contains a sine in it, put a big dot between it and something else, and remind uh, yourself that we're going to use the product rule. So that's a rule that we need to have memorized. So remember, it's going to be the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. So we're going to use the product rule on this. So this one will be our first, and this one will be the second. So I always attach or I don't always, but most of the time I will attach the constant of 5 to the x cubed. So the 5x cubed is one uh, piece of the product, and the sine of x is another. So to do the derivative of this, we're just going to do the first, write it as is. Not a bad idea to get it and put it, stick it in parentheses. 
times the derivative of the second? Well, I just have to have memorized that the derivative of a sine is a cosine. And remember that the product rule is a plus. And then we're going to do the second as is. Parentheses are your friends. And then we're going to do times the derivative of the first. Well, the derivative of 5x cubed. We drop the five, uh, 3 down next to the 5, and it multiplies, and the power goes down by 1. Now, can we do anything to that? No, we can't. Um, you could make it just look slightly prettier. Um, you know, you could make this 5x cubed cosine of x plus 15x squared sine of x. But does that do anything? No, not really. Um, so, you know, that would be our derivative. Um, so it's just a fact. You have to know the derivative of a sine is the cosine. The derivative of a cosine is negative sine. Were there any questions about that one? Sorry to write down. Okay, I'll get you. I'm sorry. I went a little fast there. Plus this column of thing is not very... Not cooperating. Very, every time I try to write, it like deletes a part of my letter. Yeah. It's annoying. This tip thing keeps coming out the bottom of the screen. I don't like it. And my notability will not load. It's been downloading for the past like 10 minutes now. Fun. I, I finished my finger. Okay. Now, um, in, this, in the second example, example 340, um, we have a quotient. There's not much we can do to make this quotient rule better. Um, you can't usually turn a quotient into a product. So if you like the product rule better than the quotient rule, if we wrote, rewrote that as 1 fourth x to the negative 2 cosine of x, you could do now the product rule because that's just a multiplication of those items. Um, so feel free to, you can always, or almost always do that. Because they want us to demonstrate the, the quotient rule in this one, and we already did a product rule example, let's do a quotient rule. So let's just leave it a quotient. Now remember our quotient rule. The derivative is the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom all over the bottom squared. So that's the rule I'm going to be utilizing for this, that the derivative is the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom all over the bottom squared. Definitely want, because we have that minus in between, because we have some things going on, definitely help uh, fix your algebra by using parentheses. Okay. But feel free, again, most of the time you can turn a quotient into a product and use the product rule. But anyway, let's get, let's go. Okay. So we're going to write the bottom times the derivative of the top. Well, the derivative of a cosine is negative sine of x. So we're going to write that minus the top times the derivative of the bottom all over the bottom square. Now, if the bottom is some quantity, like let's say it was x minus 2 or 3x minus 7, and it's a quantity or a polynomial or something, and you have to square it, don't. It's a waste of time. When it's something that simple that you can square easily, take the time to square it. So we can square 4x squared and 16x to the fourth. So if it's easy to do, do it. If not, don't worry about it. We can't do much to this. Let's just pretty it up a little bit. Let's put the negative in front of the 4x squared and then the sine of x. Let's put the 8 in front here and then the cosine of x. Usually you want to put the sine and cosine in the back of its uh, term so that that x part doesn't seem to blend in with the other x's that are sitting there. So there is our example with the quotient rule. Uh, any questions so far about the uh, 
two examples we've seen. Good so far? Okay. So here we're going to go back to what we did in um, lesson three, uh, four, just talking about how this relates to our uh, sine and cosine and the velocity acceleration, all that stuff. So many times, think about uh, sound waves. Uh, the sound wave d depicts the movement of something. So sine and cosine comes up because things do travel in, in wave patterns. So you're going to see sometimes that our position functions will contain a sine and a cosine. That's pretty common. And so in this particular example, we have this position function, and they want to know what time the particle is at rest. So remember, that is just a fancy way of asking you, when does the velocity equal zero? So you've got to get used to that language. When they say, when is the particle at rest, that means the velocity this, uh, is zero, or the speed is zero, even you could think of. So we're only using this function between 0 and 2 pi. So we, that means we're really just using one revolution around our unit circle. Because remember, our sine function is an endless wave. But we're only looking at the first kind of cycle of it, which makes finding our answer a little easier. OK, so anyway, so we've got this, this position function. Remember, we only need t's between 0 and 2 pi. So we don't need coterminal stuff. We can just, you know, the, the, the standard unit circle values. We're going to do the velocity equation, remember, which is just the first derivative. So the derivative of 2 sine of t is 2 cosine of t. Remember, you don't have to do the product rule for a constant stuck on something. The constant just multiplies by your final answer. So since the derivative of a sine is a cosine, it's just 2 cosine. And then the derivative of t is 1. So remember, a particle is at rest when its velocity is 0. So we're going to set the velocity equation equal to 0 and solve. So we get the cosine of t equals 1 half. So remember what you have to ask. Where on the unit circle is our cosine equal to 1 half? So if we think about our unit circle, the cosine is positive. That's the x value. So the x value is positive here and here. So between 0 and 2 pi, because this is 0 and there's 2 pi, we could get two answers. Now the cosine is the height, remember. That's the x value. So the x value is 1 half at pi over 6. And down here, that would be 11 pi over 6. Now how do I know that? Well, this is the point 1 half. Uh, square root of 3 over 2. And this one is the point uh, 1 half negative square root of 3 over 2. Wait a second. Um, I didn't draw that right, did I? Okay, it's not pi over 6. 3. Yeah, yeah, it's pi over 3. The points I have are right, but then I'm like, wait, that is not the point that's right there. Okay, this point <laughs> would be 1 half square root of 3 over 2. That's pi over 3. Remember, this school year, I haven't had to do trig yet. So. <laughs> and so this one is uh, 5 pi over 3. OK, that's a little better. So there are two spots where we uh, have a part where our velocity is 0 at uh, pi over 3 and at 5 pi over 3. Now, the reason you want to use um, radians. Most of the time you're going to get answers in radians. And this gives you a clue that um, you're going to use radians. They're very rarely going to use degrees. So, um, you know, feel free at any time. Like if you thought 60 degrees and then you convert it back to pi over 3, that's okay. But uh, please give your answer in radians. And this gives you a clue, hey, they used the pi. I see the pi. My answer should have a pi in it. Any questions about that one? Okay. So now 
I don't know why they did this first. Let's do this first. <laughs> oh, oh, no, we're not. We're going to do this first. So we do not have, currently, information about the derivative of a tangent. But from back in trig class, one thing I do remember about trig is that the tangent is the sine over the cosine. So I'm going to show you I'm going to prove to you what the derivative of the tangent is. Well, at least I'm going to try. So that is a quotient that we can't do anything about. It's stuck in a quotient. We're going to leave it a quotient. We have to deal with it as a quotient. So when we do the derivative, we're going to do the quotient rule. Okay, so now remember what the quotient rule was. It's the bottom times the derivative of the top. The derivative of a sine is a cosine minus the top times the derivative of the bottom. The derivative of a cosine is negative sine all over okay. all over the bottom squared. Now, something cool happens. One thing I've mentioned to you many times when we've done the, the quotient rule is that Usually doing much to the bottom isn't super helpful. This is still one of those cases. So let's leave that cosine squared. We can do a little shortcut writing. That sh is a way to write this in a little shortcut manner without the parentheses. They mean exactly the same thing. It is the whole quantity of the cosine of x squared. So if you like this, fine. If you like this notation, fine. I don't care. But you need to know that they mean the exact same darn thing. Okay. Now, what do we get here? Well, we get the cosine of x squared plus the sine of x squared. And what did we learn that sine squared plus cosine squared is equivalent to? One. One. Okay. Now, the derivative of a tangent is 1 over the cosine squared. And that's an okay fact to know. But the reciprocal of the cosine, if we don't want fractions appearing there, what is the flip or the reciprocal of our cosine? Yeah. Secant. So 1 over cosine is the secant. So 1 over cosine squared is the secant squared. Now, do we want to have to do that every single time we see a tangent? No, my goodness gracious. So instead, guess what? We just need to know the fact that the derivative of a tangent is secant squared. That is another fact that you want to have in your brain. The derivative of a tangent is secant squared. So, so far we know that the derivative of a sine is a cosine, the derivative of a cosine is a negative sine, the derivative of a tangent is secant squared. Well, you have to know all of these. Okay. Now, look at something very interesting. Every time I say a co, whether it's cosine, cotangent, or cosecant, what do I always have? A negative. If I don't say a co, so that's our sine, our tangent, and our secant, I don't have a negative. So all the cos have a negative. And the cos are a co-version of their non-co. Okay, so let me, let me <laughs> say what that means. So the derivative of a sine was a cosine. The derivative of a cosine was a negative sine. See how they kind of flip. The derivative of a tangent is secant squared. The derivative of a cotangent is negative cosecant squared. These ones kind of go together. The derivative of a secant, secant tangent. The derivative of a cosecant is negative cosecant cotangent. They're just facts. you got to have them memorized. We will have next week a memorization quiz. I will give you a list of all the facts you have to have memorized, but you have to have these memorized. No two ways about it. Because if you don't have a memorized, everything we could do from then on after, we have to do the chain rule where we might have quantities containing secants and cosines and cotangents and, and polynomials and everything all jumbled up. And so you have to know these by heart. Okay, So memorize them. So for the first time here, we are going to do the equation of a tangent line that contains the original function contains a trig. So let's, let's look at this one. So remember the rules to find the equation of a tangent line. 
The first thing you're going to do is find the derivative. The second thing you're going to do is use that to find the slope of the tangent. So you usually just plug in to the derivative. And then the third thing is you're going to use the point slope formula. That doesn't go away for our trig functions. You just now have to know how to find the derivative of a trig function. But that, those three steps are something you always need to know. Okay, so first step, find the derivative. So the derivative of a cotangent. Uh, I always go to the what's the tangents, and then it helps me remember what the cotangent is. Tangent was secant squared, so the cotangent is negative cosecant squared. The second thing we have to do is we actually have to calculate the tangent by plugging in our x value that they have given us. So our x value is negative cosecant squared of pi over 4. Now this is going to take a little bit of trig thinking. The cosecant is the flip of the sine. Pi over 4, uh, the sine of pi over 4. I love when they give us me pi over 4 is because it's squared to 0 over 2. Uh, the flip of that, so the cosecant of that, the flip of squared 2 over 2 is squared 2, like if you did the work. Uh, the flip of squared 3 over 3 is squared 3. The flip of squared 5 over 5 is squared 5. So it's just kind of an interesting way it works itself out. And so this is the negative square root of 2 squared, that value squared. So square root of 2, when you square it, becomes... 2, and then we got a negative, so it's negative 2. Now, another fact that we need to know is we need a point. We need an x and a y. We gave, they gave us the x. We need the x and the y. So the y value is just going to be the cotangent of pi over 4. Now remember, the cotangent is uh, cosine over sine. So they're both square root of 2 over 2, which is awesome that they were kind to us. So that's just square root of 2 over 2 divided by square root of 2 over 2, or 1. So we have the point pi over 4, 1. So the third step now is ready to go. We have a point, we have a slope, we use the point-slope formula. So it's going to be y minus 1 equals negative 2 times x minus pi over 4. Can you do much? Eh, not really. Uh, do I need you to do any more? No. Nah. Feel free to stop there. Unless the assignment says put it in slope-intercept form, unless the back of the book they solved it for y, and you want to check your work. Otherwise, for my purposes, I know you know how to do algebra. You're in a calculus class. So, you know, feel free to stop right there. Any questions about that? So, you wondered why at the beginning of the school year we looked at our unit circle again. Because things like this. Now, they usually aren't necessarily testing you too much on your unit circle values. They usually give you pi over 3s, pi over 6s, or pi over 4s. Something related to those main good ones. So, any questions on 343? Okay. Now, let's do one that has some problems. If we want to find the derivative of this, you know that a sum is no issue. You just do each individual derivative. But the problem I see here is that we have a multiplication on this back end. So only this piece is going to require that we do the product rule. First times the derivative of the second plus second times the derivative of the first. Okay. So when we do the derivative of this one, the secant's derivative is secant tangent. The cosecant is negative cosecant cotangent. Just a fact you got to memorize. But this second piece here, we have to actually physically do the product rule. So I do always tend to put that little multiplication dot just so that my brain looks at it and actually tries to remember <laughs> that I got to do something a little fancy. So it's going to be first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. 
Uh, there's not much you can really do to that. It is kind of just, eh. you don't need the one. So if you didn't even put the one down on the paper, that's perfectly accepted. So as you can tell, these rules are going to start to kind of be blending together more and more and more and more. And it's your job to try to recognize what I can do to find that derivative. Any questions on 344? It's just the tangent of x. So if you didn't even want to put the 1, uh, you didn't have to. I put the parentheses there just to, just in case it comes out to be something. So I know that the x is not attached to that because that x there, it's the tangent of x only. And if you have a 2 or, or another x sitting next to it, it looks like you want to blend them and don't blend them. So I like parentheses. Any other questions about 344? Let's take a look at this one. This is the 74th derivative of a sine. Now, this is super easy and you don't have to do it. We're going to look at a pattern, okay? So here's the, the first, or the, the, the beginning function, okay? Here's the first derivative, cosine, right? There's a pattern. Yeah. Okay, wait. Here's the second derivative, negative sine, right? Here's the third derivative. Uh, the derivative of a sine is a cosine, so that's negative cosine. So then, right? What are we back to? Fourth time. Positive sine. Positive sine. So it's kind of like this. In mathematics, in number, number theory, um, there's something called mod 4 division. And you're kind of looking at um, how is it related to the number 4. So if I uh, divide that number by 4, how many extras do I have? So if we think about the number 74, okay? 74 divided by 4 is um, almost, yeah, it's uh, 72. Okay, let's, let's, I'm doing old school thing division <laughs> so because my brain was like stepping ahead of me there okay see how our remainder is two okay so let's think about it the first 18 sets of four that I do we're always going to jump back to sign again we're going to be right back to where I started so, you're gonna take so the remainder and then that's gonna be which derivative exactly you. so my remainder tells me that I did it two extra times because the 72nd one, 18 times 4 is 72, the 72nd one, I got back to sign again. So then the last two would get me in the pattern. So the answer to that is negative sine of x. It's like a, it's like a magic Oh, it's exactly yeah, like yeah. the pattern. And, and what's interesting about imaginaries, imaginaries do, do mod 4 in a way as well. That, that 4 pattern comes up. Um, it's not always going to be 4, but uh, for the sine, and I think the cosine might even be a 4 power. Let, let, let's, let's look at what a cosine does. Cosine over the sine, which would go to negative cosine, which would go to negative sine. Yeah, it's a 4 as well. And why did I make 4 slashes instead of IV? I didn't even think about that. <laughs> Hi. Thank you. So yeah, it has a 4, four pattern as well. Yeah, yeah, cool. Very neat. So um, that's just, they threw those in there to, so you see the pattern. Okay. Okay. Are we going to do that one again? <laughs> I don't even know. Okay. Yeah, they're kind of. I, I really, I've always been a person that uh, enjoys 
the patterns yeah. that, uh, that occur. Uh, um, so my brain is is not normal. I think you guys have known that. But um, um, so in um, when I was studying my graduate work in, in math, uh, I was very diverse in the things I studied. So I studied a lot of like statistical stuff, but then I also studied uh, number theory, and then I also studied um, like it's called abstract algebra and and some some and they're not necessarily things that people would study together. Yeah. Most people either like the abstract stuff, or, and then they like the the number theory, or they like the like you know stats yeah. is more of like a real life stuff. When I went to go take, I had to take written exams and oral exams. And when I went to take my oral exams, I had to pick three things that I was going to be questioned on. And I remember when I picked my three things, and I don't remember exactly what I picked exactly, but it was some of those things I talked about. And I remember some of the professors going, this is a very strange combination. <laughs> yeah. One of the coolest things I've seen is when people would take, it's like this weird theoretical stuff, uh -huh. but you take the y-axis and graph, and uh -huh. you subdivide it by like a complex number, so like 2i plus 1. Uh -huh. It creates like these crazy patterns. Oh. Yeah. Well, it's interesting if you if you graph some uh, like it's called polar, and if you graph polar graphs, you did that last year. yeah, polar graphs do that. They they come up with flowers and things, and then you can throw like the three D elements to it, and you get cool. these just really interesting curves. Okay, do we have? Yeah, I thought this was about it. Last example. Okay, so. Um, it says a particle moves along a coordinate axis. Uh, the position function is given by s of t. We want to know the velocity at pi over 4, the acceleration at pi over 4. We want to compare these to see if it's speeding up or slowing down. So remember, if they're going in opposite directions, opposite signs, that would be speeding up. Same direction uh, would be, oh, I'm sorry. Other way around. Opposite signs, they would be fighting against each other. They would slow down. Same sign, they would be speeding up in that direction. Okay, so let's do our derivatives. So the first derivative is uh, a negative cosine. That's our velocity. The second derivative is... Uh, our acceleration, so we just have to find those. Um, let's plug in pi over 4 for each. So the velocity at pi over 4 is the negative cosine of pi over 4. We know pi over 4 squared root 2 over 2, so that's negative square root 2 over 2. The uh, acceleration at pi over 4 is the sine of pi over 4 which is positive square root 2 over 2. Now, that means that the velocity and acceleration are fighting against one another. So that means that it would be slowing down. So if you get opposite signs at that point, then you are um, slowing down. So that's pretty decent. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. This is your assignment, 435. Um, and that's really what we're going to be doing for the rest of the week is working on the 3, 4, and 3, 5 stuff. Okay. Uh, I have another question. 